We're still in Colossians chapter 1, and we've been staying in this passage between verses 9 and 13, um, where Paul is praying, or he's telling them, this is how I'm praying for you. He says, I'm praying that you would be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. He says, bearing fruit in every good work. And this is as Paul begins to describe what that means to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. This is the first thing that he mentions, um, bearing fruit in every good work. And I feel like it's important for us to understand what Paul's talking about and understand what this means to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Um, this is a prayer he was praying for the Colossian believers, but it's a prayer that we should continue to pray today for ourselves and for our churches and for our families and those of us who know and follow the Lord, that we would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. We need to understand what that means to do that. And so today we're going to look at um, what this means to bear fruit in every good work. Um, and to, to, to get into that, I want to just focus on these two phrases, bearing fruit and good works. What does this what does this mean um, to bear fruit in every good work? We'll start with good works. Um, what are good works? To sum it up briefly, a good work is just an act of compassion or self-sacrifice on behalf of somebody else and done in the name of Jesus out of you know, a heart of love or compassion, kindness towards someone. Um, good work could be um, giving someone food when they're they don't have anything to eat. Could be um, helping someone who's homeless get off the streets or get in a better living situation. It could be helping someone through an addiction. Could be helping you know someone maybe who loses a loved one to walk through that period of grief. It could be um, being um, someone who visits someone who doesn't have anyone who's lonely. Maybe an older person who lost their spouse. There's there's a million different ways that we could describe a good work. But it, it, to sum it up, like I said, it's basically an act of compassion or self sacrifice on behalf of someone else um, and done in the name of Jesus. In uh, Matthew chapter 25. Jesus um, is standing before the uh, the world, basically, believers and unbelievers. He's judging them. And um, in verses 36 through 40, it says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And so Jesus describes these very practical, tangible things that his followers did for people on the earth. He said, well, Lord, when did we do those things for you? He said, tell you the truth, that as much as you've done it unto the least of these, my brothers, you've done it unto me. Okay, and so Jesus views those things as when we've done that for someone else and we've done it in his name and, and with his heart of love and compassion, um, he views that as having done it to him. Okay, and so there's four things that I basically want to say about good works, um, basically to sum up what they are, what they're not, and how they function in the life of a believing person. And the first one is this, good works are not the basis of our salvation, okay? Um, in fact, good works are not the thing we're saved by. They don't bring us into salvation. We don't earn our way. And this is sort of a misconception that our culture has. Those who think sort of from a Christian-y perspective, um, they think in this way, like when, when we die and we leave this body, we stand before God, he's gonna take all of our good works and put them in one side of the scale. He's gonna take every bad thing we ever did and put on the other side of the scale. And if our good deeds outweigh our are bad, then we're in, right? We're in and we can float around on a cloud and play the harp for a billion years. Um, but that really has no basis in reality. The fact is that our good works don't save us. We're not saved because of our good works. Um, in, in fact, in Titus chapter 3, we're going to read this passage here, verse 4, he says, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. Okay, and so he's saying, look, it's when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, and that's the motivation, is goodness and loving kindness, he saved us, okay? Not because of any good works that we did out of our own righteousness, but according to his own mercy. In other words, he saved us because of his mercy. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, he says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, lest anyone should boast. We are saved because of his mercy. We're saved because of his grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And a good work is not something that, that, that adds to our salvation. It's not something that earns our way in. In fact, the good work is supposed to be something that comes out of our salvation, a result of it, right? It's, it's something that's born of the change that God works on the inside of us. And that's my second point, right? That good works are not what, what uh, uh, the base of our salvation, but the second point is this, good works are what we were, were created for, okay? And so out of the good work that God does in us, um, you know, it says, for by grace you've been saved in verse eight and nine, um, through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And verse 10 says this, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for 
good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Okay, and so um, clearly God does this work in us of salvation. He, he saves us by his mercy. He saves us by his grace. But as we are changed, as we're filled with the spirit of God, and he begins to produce his fruit in our lives out of that place, um, we begin to walk in the good works, which he's prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. But my third point is this, that doing good works requires our active obedience. Okay. And so in verse 10, it seems to indicate that, hey, they're his good works. He's prepared them beforehand. It says, but that we should walk in them, right? We should, we should walk in them. In Titus 3.8, um, Paul says, the saying is trustworthy and I want you to insist on these things. Like as the pastor of the church over there, right? I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. Okay, so we are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he's prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And yet as we come across this good work, okay, we're not running around trying to look for good works that we can do or make up some ideas of what are some good works we can do. God's already prepared those beforehand. And as we're walking with him, walking, abiding in him, connected to him, filled with his spirit, we come across in the course of our lives an opportunity to serve him in some good work in the life of another person. Okay, but we have a choice whether or not to engage with that person and to actually step into that situation and to meet the tangible need that the person has in that moment. You come out of 7-Eleven, there's someone, they might be a dirty, they might be uh, unkept, they might not smell very well, and they ask you, listen, do you happen to have any spare change so I can just get something to eat? And you know, you think, you know what, I don't have any cash on me. I, I don't have money. You know, sorry, I don't have anything on me. Um, better luck next time or have a nice day. God bless. Okay. Um, but it might be easier to do that, but in that moment, do you have compassion on the person? Despite their drug addiction, despite their alcohol addiction, despite their mental illness, despite their smell, whatever it is that's going on in their life, do you have the compassion of Christ? Does the love of Christ just kind of motivate you to go, you know what, I don't have cash, but I do have my debit card. I do have my credit card. And you know what, let me go in and get you something to eat. What would you like? Do you want a hot dog? Do you want a slice of pizza? Do you, do you want some chips? Can I get you something to drink, right? And, and this is our, our will, we have to engage our own will in the situation to actually obey Christ, step into the situation and meet the need just as Christ did in his earthly ministry. Do you remember the leper crying out, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Well, he was passing by. He could have just kept on walking, but he stopped. He heard the man and he reached out and he touched him. He realized in that moment that the greatest need of this leper was human contact that he probably hadn't had since his diagnosis, right? He hadn't had a single human touch in his life. Um, since that moment of diagnosis, Jesus sees his greatest need is to, to have human touch. And then next, salvation and healing comes to the man because of Jesus's touch and his attention. And this is the way that God engages us with the people around us. Yes, we need to speak the gospel, but sometimes first we just need to meet the, the present need, the urgent need in the person's life. And it takes us engaging our will in active obedience to walk in the good works, which he's prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And the last thing I wanna say is that the good works that we walk in are good works that originate in the Lord. In other words, it's not something that comes from our own brain as we're trying to figure out what we can do in order to, you know, gather up some good works and some good credit in heaven. These are the things that God does. And it's because of the work that he's doing in us and that the work that he wants to do through us. Okay. In Philippians 2.13, it says, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Okay. So as God's doing this work on the inside of us, he's changing our will. He's changing our desires. He's changing our affections. He's changing our heart. And as this fruit of the spirit begins to manifest in our lives, now we care about the situation the person's going through, right? And so he gives us the will. He works in us to will, to even engage and to do anything for any other person besides ourselves, right? But he also empowers us to work. He works in us both to will and to work. And he gives us the power that we need to step into that situation. He provides us what we need in order to meet that need and step into that situation in his power with his love and with his words of compassion amen um, so that's good works but what is how do we define what is good fruit right bearing fruit in every good work um, what is fruit in Galatians chapter 5 he gives us a list of what are the fruit of the Spirit in, in verse um, 13 of chapter 5 he says but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience kindness goodness gentleness faithfulness and self-control okay and so these are the things that begin to manifest in our lives when we are saved and we're changed by him when he takes our heart of stone out and puts in its place a heart of flesh and he begins to to cause us and conform us into the image of christ himself okay um few things i want to say um about bearing fruit the first one is this that bearing fruit 
oftentimes is the motivating factor in him changing our will in order to walk in the things that he's prepared for us, right? So um, bearing fruit in our life can produce or motivate us to good works. In Hebrews chapter 10, he tells us, let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. Love is a fruit of the spirit. Good works is the action that comes out of us. Because of his love, we look on the other person with kindness. We look on them with compassion. We, we approach them with peace and with gentleness, right? Because of the fruit of the spirit that's within us. The next point I want to make about the fruit of the spirit is this. We can do good works. It's technically possible to do good works without bearing fruit. Right? In other words, you can give a bunch of money to somebody and a big old generous donation, but you're doing it for a tax deduction, not because you're motivated by love to meet a need. Um, we can help an old lady across the street, um, but it's not because we're feeling kind toward her and generous toward her. It's because we need, we're in a hurry. We want her out of our way. Yeah, so it's possible to do good works without bearing fruit, but God has called us to bear fruit in every good work. That the works that we do in him and through him and by his power in the lives of other people, that we're doing it from a place of, of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. That we're doing it motivated by his love and his heart because he's living within us. Amen. His spirit is within us. Christ is in us in his spirit. He's changing us and motivating us into good works that we can walk in and affect the lives around us through our love, through our compassion and our generosity. Okay, um, uh, the last question I guess we need to address is how? How can I bear good fruit, right? How can I bear fruit unto God? And we're going to just look at a quick passage in John chapter 15. Jesus is about to go to the cross. He's trying to impart important truth to his disciples before he goes. And he says this in verses 4 and 5. This is how you bear fruit in Christ. Ready? Abide in me. Abide in me. And I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. In other words, abide means to remain, right? Um, remain in him, remain connected. If you take the branch and take it away from the vine, it does nothing. It just withers and dies. But if it stays connected into the vine, then life throw, flows through the vine and into the branch to produce its fruit. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And as so, so this is the picture as we begin to put all these things together that we've talked about today. Um, the, the, the picture is God redeeming us to himself in Christ. And we are made alive in Christ, filled with the very presence of God himself, right? Christ in us through his spirit and all the fullness of God, pleased to dwell in Christ. We're brought into this union, communion with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, being changed and transformed from the inside to the outside, that God could live his life through us, that Jesus Christ could live his life through us on this earth. We become the branch abiding within the vine. And as we abide in Christ and he abides in us, we receive his life in us and his life through us begins to manifest fruit. And our father is the great vine dresser. And as he begins to see this fruit manifested in our lives because we're abiding in Christ, he begins to prune us. And we feel the pinch. We feel the sting. We feel the snip, the little pain in our life as he prunes us. And yet as he does, we produce even more fruit. And as he is working in us to produce this fruit, he is working in us both to will and to work a according to his good pleasure. This fruit is manifesting in our lives as love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control as he's working in us both to will and to work according to his good purpose. And as he does this, we begin to walk in all of the good works which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And as we walk in these good works that God's prepared before us, that we should walk in them bearing the fruit of the Spirit he begins to touch the lives of other people around us, that they also might receive him, that they also might be redeemed to him, that they might be grafted as well into the vine and begin to bear fruit in their own lives. As we do the works that he's prepared beforehand, bearing the fruit of the spirit, his light begins to shine on us and, 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 and our, the people see our good deeds and they glorify our Father who is in heaven. This is why Paul prays that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work.